Come praise and glorify our God, the Father of our Lord. In Christ he has in heavenly realms his blessings on us poor. For pure and blameless in his sight he destined us to be. And now we've been adopted through his Son eternally. To the praise of your glory, to the praise of your mercy and grace, to the praise of your glory, you are the God who saves. Come praise and glorify our God who gives his grace in Christ. In him our sins are washed away, redeemed through sacrifice. In him God has made known to us the mystery of his will, that Christ should be the head of all his purpose to fulfill. To the praise of your glory, to the praise of your mercy and grace, to the praise of your glory, you are the God who saves. Come praise and glorify our God, for we believe the word. And through our faith we have a seal, the Spirit of the Lord. The Spirit guarantees our hope until redemption's done. Until we join in endless praise to God the three in one. To the praise of your glory, to the praise of your mercy and grace. To the praise of your glory, you are the God who saves. To the praise of your glory, to the praise of your mercy and grace, to the praise of your glory, you are the God who saves.
will continue singing this morning. Page number 73, let's stand together, lift him up. He is worthy of our praise, he is worthy to be lifted up high and above everything. Page number 73, lift him up. that second here in just a little bit but kids you are dismissed to your classes and as they're dismissing to your to their classes to junior church take time right now and find someone you haven't said hi to yet and try to say hi to five people that you haven't yet said hi to our pianos will play say 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 hi to someone Let's sing on that second. I know some of you are still saying hi, and that's a great thing. We'll sing together on that second as you're making your way back to your seats. What amazing sacrifice. What pure and selfless love. Robing me in righteousness to reign with him above. Oh, how. How many of you enjoyed getting to say hi to people again during the song? It's been a couple years since we've been able to do that, and uh, that's exciting. Man, would you please come forward? We'll take uh, this morning's tithe and offering. Why they do, uh, remember Jean Thompson in prayer, if you were, that her sister Zena passed away yesterday, and uh, so keep her, keep her in the, the family in prayer, if you would, and then remember Carolyn Yoder in prayer. She had her surgery this last week and uh, doing well, and she has a message that she wanted Stephanie to pass on. Stephanie, would you want to share that real quick? Ha, 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 ha. 
<laughs> oh, well, it's funny how the Lord can make someone that you've known not really that long feel like family, isn't it? And uh, we've learned to love Carolyn, and, and thank you, Stephanie, for that. And I'm praying she gets feeling better soon. Jai, would you mind praying for us this morning? Well, a couple of things to remind you of this morning. Uh, first off, you know it by this point, but a week from today starts our missions conference, and we've been talking to our missionaries, and uh, they'll start getting here Thursday and Friday, and then we'll have a uh, missions conference next Sunday through next Wednesday, and looking forward to each service of that uh, week. And on the back, on the podium, you'll find a little brochure, it's a trifold, and it kind of has the schedule for the week, it has a little bit of information about each of those missionaries, and uh, so grab one of those on your way out, I hope you know what to be prepared for, how to be praying, and uh, get to know our missionaries a little bit. And then one of the things we are doing next week, of course, will be uh, our Sunday school classes are making booths in the back, and I've seen some of those, and uh, those are going to be exciting. And so we'll have that Monday night and Tuesday night. But on Wednesday night, we are doing a birthday party. Uh, the missionaries that are coming in, I believe there's eight kids amongst the uh, families that are coming. And uh, we want to treat them a little special, let them know that they're cared about and loved. So we're going to do a birthday party on that Wednesday night. And uh, if you'd like to be part of it, in the pew in front of you, you'll probably see a little blue envelope. And uh, if you would like to donate to those birthday presents, just put money in that. Uh, drop in the offering plate. Uh, drop it uh, this evening, if you would, and uh, we'll we'll take that money, and then we'll be able to get those kids some presents. I think that'll be exciting for them, and it's good for us, too, to be able to give back in that way. So that'll be next week, the 3rd through the 6th, all right? And then uh, just to put it in the back of your mind, on the 17th is Easter this year, and uh, we have a special day planned that day. We have Dr. Steve Pettit. He's the president of Bob Jones University. He's going to be coming and speaking. He's going to bring his music team with him, and you'll enjoy that. And uh, we're going to, before that service, have a breakfast, and you'll really enjoy that. And so uh, we'll, we'll meet here at the church at 930 and uh, have a breakfast. It'll be provided by uh, the church staff, and then right afterwards we'll have the service with Dr. Pettit, and uh, that'll be a good day, okay? And then two more quick ones, and then Josh is going to come and give us our missionary update. Uh, but just, I don't know if this it affects you, I just want to communicate with you guys. Uh, this coming Wednesday will be the last Wednesday that me and Karis will be in charge of the teens and the youth group. And uh, Pastor Joey's going to transition and, and take over that ministry. And uh, it's hard to believe, it's almost 10 years that we've been with the uh, kids ministry and uh, teens. And uh, end of June, I think, would have been 10 years. Uh, so we got out just in the nick of time uh, <laughs> on that one. And, uh, but... Uh,
Pastor Joey's going to do a great job. He really is. He's, he's gifted in that area, has a heart for the young people. And uh, so, so I'm excited about where that's going to be going going forward. And then uh, one last announcement. Uh, Chris Radcliffe asked me to announce if you would uh, like to be part of the Sheepdog Ministry, our security team, they're going to meet on May 1st at 5 o'clock on a Sunday evening uh, right before the service. All right. Well, Josh, why don't you come? Josh has done a great job keeping our hearts kind of focused on missions this last year and a half in between our uh, missions conferences, and I uh, appreciate him doing that. So, Josh, why don't you come, update us on some of our missionaries, and uh, go from there. Good morning. As I fumble through my notes here, I've been doing that an awful lot lately, but that's all right. So, anyways, our missions conference next week, and... Uh, and missions has always been been on my heart. It's just something that's it's passionate, um, but also it's something that God has commanded us to to, to do. Um, but um, three missionaries this morning I want to touch base on, and I think you'll you guys will enjoy it. Um, but the Webers in Australia, uh, they titled their last prayer letter "On Again, Off Again," um, and actually they just sent out their March prayer letter this morning. So this is fresh. But it says, with ministries back in full swing, we've found ourselves running off our feet these days, which is actually just the way we like it. But just when the thing started to pick up, all, the, all that came to a screeching halt once again. Our entire family has ended up in isolation for seven days after contracting COVID. In fact, last Sunday, church had to go on without a pastor. We thank God for our wonderful deacons who ran the entire service while the message was recorded from home. And after a rough few days of sickness, we're now doing fine, and we're getting, we're already getting stir crazy, and looking forward to getting back to business on Tuesday. So, praise the Lord for that. Uh, they list five praises. It says ministries are back in full swing. Um, number two, encouraging ladies retreat on March fifth. Um, a great team of deacons stepping up in their absence, and then um, Sarah, one of their daughters. A successful first day of work at McDonald's. And then uh, the last one is God's protection during our re recent COVID spell. They do have some prayer requests. And the one is the COVID surge leaving our church severely depleted. And haven't we seen that through through the last few years? It's, it's been difficult. but So pray for them for that. Uh, pray for encouragement toward prayer and fellowship. Pray that salvation for Anna's friend Catherine. And pray that a good testimony at work for their girls. Actually, both their girls uh, work at McDonald's. And so um, keep them in prayer. And then number five, wisdom and all their furlough preparations. So they'll actually be back in the States in October this year. So be praying for that. Uh, the next ones is the Haley's in Botswana. We know them very, very well. But they start off the, the prayer letter with um, several praises. And in the very first one, it says, 13 precious souls have professed their faith in Jesus Christ since January 1. So it's, it's the work, the work of the, God's work is, is being accomplished. 14 were baptized into membership of Grace Baptist Church in Gaborone. Four joined Grace Baptist Church by statement of faith. The first new church plant for 2022 has begun with four saved and a lot of excitement about it. Printing has begun on the next batch of 20,000 copies of the Setswana New Testament. Kelly completed her continued discipleship course, got a new job, and keeps growing in Christ. Emily, Miss Pamela, and Ramon, all, all three received their permits to work. Um, Cindy and I celebrated our 31st wedding anniversary. 31, uh, excuse me, 31 years of marriage and ministry together, so incredible feat there as well um, then he goes on to say for reasons I simply cannot understand we lost our appeal with the land tribunal to the to use the plot that was donated to us for the church the blessing is is that we have been able to rent a very nice and wonderfully accommodating private school auditorium on a campus just right across the road and, won't, and we will not have to relocate the church away it will only cost us $400 a month, and this will also give time to purchase a permanent property at, the, at which time we'll disassemble the structure we've built and use it there. 
for so many of you have so faithfully prayed for this situation. Please praise the Lord with us and that we have a place to meet and pray for the Lord to lead us to a permanent solution. So in prayer, they do ask, we, we lack $3,000 to pay the $25,000 for the printing of the Sitswana New Testaments. Um, many of their Faith Bible Institute students have final tests for graduation in May. Uh, so pray, pray for their studies. Pray for Pastor Am Amantle. Um, he's been given land from his father to build a house on. Um, they want to help him there. Um, also pray for the salvation of several that is listed here. So they, they've been ministering. And then pray for their ministry team. Mike, Mom, Cindy, Emily, Miss Pamela, Pastor Mano, and Mrs. I'm not going to try to pronounce that name. Um, Ramon, Richard, and our church family for unity, wisdom, patience, and grace as we love one another and labor together. Um, and then the last one uh, is John and Marshall Riggs, missionaries to Zambia. It says one such opportunity came up in February when Pastor Bawela asked me to teach the pastors from another city and the surrounding area of the subject of missions. He goes, I never get tired of teaching about the Great Commission. I, looked at, I took the opportunity to give away books to the pastors and met and came to the meeting. And they were grateful to receive the books. Um, that meeting went well. And then he goes on to say, um, Marshall led a young man to the Lord on the last Sunday in February during the visitation outreach of Cornerstone Baptist Church in Nadola. And then on Sunday, a young man that received a tract on Saturday came to our church an hour early, and Eric, our youth pastor, led him to the Lord. So they list a prayer request to pray for the churches in Zambia that they will get involved and support these men as they are carrying our great commission to their Jerusalem. So, isn't it encouraging to hear from our missionaries? You know, they're so far away, but yet, you know, God just continues to work through them um, and continues his, his work of the ministry. Amen. Thank you, Josh. Let's stand together, page number 13. Bow the knee. What a privilege it is to come to God's presence with the, the one who loves us, but the one who is also in control of all things. Let's sing together. Page number 13, Bow the Knee. <laughs>
every step we take. There are times when circumstances make perfect sense to us as we try to understand each move he makes. When the path grows dim and our questions have no answers, turn to him. Bow the knee, trust the heart of your Father when the answer goes beyond what you can see. Bow the knee, lift your eyes toward heaven and believe the one who holds eternity. And when you don't understand the purpose of his plan in the presence of your king, bow the knee. There are days when clouds surround us and the rain begins to fall. The cold and lonely winds won't cease to blow. And there seems to be no reason for the suffering we feel. We are tempted to believe God does not know. But when the storms arise, don't forget we walk by faith and not by sight. Bow the knee, trust the heart of your Father when the answer goes beyond what you can see. Bow the knee, lift your eyes toward heaven and believe the one who holds eternity. you can see. Bow the knee, lift your eyes toward heaven, and believe the one who holds eternity. And when you don't understand the purpose of his plan, in the presence of your King, bow Thank you for that, Sam. Turn to Romans 12, if you would, Romans chapter 12. And I tell you, after a week where life just kind of beats us up, I love good music before service. It kind of helps our hearts get refocused and ready for God's Word, and uh, it's a great ministry. So thank you so much for that. And uh, Romans chapter 12, if you would, today will be in the first two verses, and kind of familiar verses, but helpful verses. And, and I want to give you a few thoughts today as we look at the writings of the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 12. And let's start out in verse 1 and go down through verse 2. It says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Let's pray, and uh, we'll get into this passage this morning. Lord, we pray that you would meet with us this morning. Help us not to be here by ourselves, but Lord, would you send your power? Would you give me clarity as I try to communicate your truth and that uh, your word would do a work in our hearts? And I, I pray that you would just meet with us this morning. I pray for our missions conference next week. I pray that we would have hearts that are ready for it and uh, that you would do a great work next week and give direction. And we thank you for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The book of Romans, it's one of the greatest masterpieces in the book of God, in my opinion. 
It's a, a book that has been used in an amazing way in so many people's life. The Apostle Paul is the one that wrote it. And uh, if you know anything about the Apostle Paul, he was fantastic at arguing. He loved to argue, and, and he was a guy who most times won when he argued. They say that it used to be that those that were studying at law school, in order to be lawyers, they were required to read and study the book of Romans in order to see the right way to lay out a case. Because in the gospel, or in, in Romans, Paul lays out the argument for the gospel uh, in a way that it's hard to argue with. It's just an incredible book. But as profound as this book is, and, and as deep as this book is, it's also some simple truths in this book. When I was in uh, Gene Triplett at the time, Gene, Gene Thompson's now uh, Sunday school class, when I was in fourth or fifth grade, one of the things she had our class do was memorize the Romans Road. Did you ever do that before? And she took us through that summer, and she had prizes and incentives, and, and by the end of that summer, we all had those simple verses in the book of Romans memorized, and we could explain it. And I can't tell you, through the course of my life, how many young people after a Wednesday night service or an activity or a teen camp, I've sat down and gone through those exact verses and showed them how they can have a relationship with God. Uh, this, this last week on Tuesday, I was uh, out getting supplies for the missions conference. I came back, and uh, Joey was in the office, and a guy had come into the office. We didn't know him, and uh, he wanted just to talk to somebody. And so Joey got to sit down in the office. And after a while of talking, Joey took him to these same verses we were just talking about and talked through the Romans road, and that guy ended up accepting Christ and getting saved this week. And I think about the book of Romans and the way it's been used in so many's lives. Maybe you came to know the Lord through the book of Romans. And a book that is so profound that it's studied in law school, but yet it's so simple that a child can memorize it and explain it. It's a wonderful book. Well, we get to Romans chapter 12, and, and he gives two very important verses here. They're very important because they tell us what God wants from us. Have you ever thought about that? What is it that God wants from you? Some people, you ask them, what does God want from you? And they say, well, well God wants me to follow a list of rules. There's a list of sins, and if I don't do those sins, then God's pretty happy with me. Some people, they, they think God wants me to do a bunch of religious rituals. God wants me to come to services and, and, and read scripture, and he, he wants me to pray, and he wants me to do these religious rituals. Some people, if you watch televangelists online, they say, God wants your money. <laughs> he, he wants you to have faith and send that money, and if you send money, then you'll be rich, and you'll be, uh, you'll be healthy, and, and, and health and wealth, and, and they think God just wants your money. But in Romans 12, the first two verses, God tells us what he wants. And it's bigger than any of the things we've talked about before. It goes beyond any of the things we just mentioned. What, what God wants from each and every one of his followers is unconditional surrender. He wants us to completely, wholeheartedly give every area of our life to him. Whether it's the small things or the big things, the, the, the big decisions like who am I going to marry and where am I going to work, or the small decisions like what am I going to watch on TV and what kind of music am I going to allow in my life, God wants us to come to him and completely surrender our life. He, he doesn't want us just to give him Sunday. He wants us to give us Monday through Sunday. He, he wants us to give every element of our life. He wants us to be completely sold out, holding nothing back, and, and saying, God, my life is unconditionally surrendered to you. Now, if you hear that, like I hear that, my response is that, that's a pretty big ask. That, that's a pretty big request to give everything, all of my life, all the time, every day of the week, everything I have, all, all, all that I am, all that I have to give it to the Lord. That, that, that's a big ask. Why should I do that? Well, why should we give our lives completely surrendered to God? How would you answer that? If you had a 16-year-old son or daughter and they came to you and they said, they said, why should I completely give my life to God? How would you answer them? Well, I know how the Apostle Paul would answer because he answers it in verses 1 and 2 of this text. He, he tells us why we should live our lives unconditionally surrendered to God. And he starts out by answering it one uh, of four ways in this passage. He takes four different angles on this answer. The, the first response he gives to this question is a passionate Look at verse 1. He says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. He said, I beseech you. That's the word beg. He, he says, I plead with you. I beg with you. 
And then he calls them brethren. He, he, he's referring to them in the sense that, that you are my brother or sister in Christ. He says, I, I love you. He says, I'm about to ask you to do something, and it's not going to benefit me at all. He says, the only reason I'm begging you to do this is because I love you and I want what's best for you. And so, so I'm going to ask you to do something. He says, he, he says, I beseech you to unconditionally surrender to God by the mercies of God. Why should we surrender to God? Because of the mercies of God. He, 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 he says here, I, I, I like the way he puts it. He says, mercies of God. It's plural. It's not a singular thing or a one-time thing. The, the mercy of God is something that if we try to number it in our lives, we'd never be able to do it. God's mercy in our life, it, it, it's just infinite. And Paul, what he does in the first 11 verse chapters of Romans is he lays out the mercy of God. In chapters 1 through 3, he talks about our sin. And one of the things I like about Paul is, is Paul did not care about being politically correct at all. He, he would just shoot straight, and he, he would tell you how it was, and, and he comes to the issue of sin, and he tells us how wicked our hearts are, and how sinful our hearts are, and, and how our hearts are, are, are not just that we sin, but we have a heart that has a sin nature. It's not just that we do sin, it's that we are sin-natured people. You ever go to the pool and take a uh, football or basketball with you? And you go out to that pool, and inevitably, what do you do sometime while you're out in that pool? You take that ball, and you dunk it under the water, don't you? And just to, to, to see how long you can keep it under there. But eventually, you get tired, or, or eventually, you lose interest, and you take your hand off that ball, and what happens? It resurfaces. That's what Paul says in the first three chapters of Romans. He says, we have sin natures. He says, you can tamp it down for a while. You, you, you can cause yourself to do what's right for a short period of time, but eventually that sin nature is going to resurface. That's why the things that you say you're not going to do, you end up doing them. The things you say you're not going to do again, you end up doing them again because we have a sin nature. And he makes no bones about it. He says, because we are sinners, because we have a sin nature, we don't deserve to go to heaven. He says, because of our sin nature and there's a holy God who cannot allow sin or sinners into heaven, God can't allow us there. Because God is a just God who, who can't just ignore sin or wink at sin or sweep it under the rug, God is a just God who has to deal with sin, and, and he lays out our problem of sin, which I tell you, when you understand the backdrop of our sin, it makes our salvation that much more beautiful, doesn't it? When, uh, when me and Karis were dating, we had been dating for several months, and uh, I did something I'd never done before, went a place I'd never been before. And I walked into a jewelry store. You guys done this before? And uh, I go up to the guy, and I, I, said, I, I said, hey, I, I need a ring. And he said, well, what cut, what color, what clarity? And I, I said, I, I want it round to fit on her finger. That's what I want. I want a ring. <laughs> and he said, okay, all right. And so he, he, he pulled out this little box of diamonds that, that you can pick your diamond to, to put in that ring. But before he let me look at the ring, he, he, he pulled out a little piece of black cloth. A velvet black cloth. And he, he laid it out on the counter, and then he, he, he took those diamonds, and he, he sprawled them out on that black cloth. And the reason they do that is because with the backdrop of that black cloth, it, it, it makes those diamonds shimmer that much more. That, that's what Romans 1 through 3 is. Romans 1 through 3 is the backdrop of our sin. And, and when we understand our sin and, and the punishment our sin deserves and how wretched we are, that just makes our salvation that much more beautiful. And he goes and he says that God loved you at your worst. When you were filthy in your sin, in Romans 5 it says, but God committed his love towards us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We have a God who loved us at, a, at, a, at our worst. He talks about our sin in chapters 1 through 3. He talks about our salvation in chapters 4 through 5. He, he tells us, he talks a lot about this word called justified. Justified, is a, it's an accounting term. It's the idea of Christ's righteousness being accounted to our account. Sometimes we, we sing a song around here called His Robes for Mine. Anybody heard that song before? And, and the song, the premise of the song is how we were wearing our, our, our garments that were just filthy with sin. And Christ was over here wearing and clothed in righteousness. And to justify us, what Christ did is he, he, he took his sinless garment, his righteousness, and he put it on us, and he took and he wore our sin-stained garments. That's what Christ did. 
Christ came and, and he justified us so that we no longer have to be enemies of God, but we can be righteous before God. When God looks at us, he no longer sees our sin, but he sees Christ's righteousness. He talks about our sin, then he talks about salvation, and then in verses six through, chapter 6 through 8, he talks about our sanctification. You know, it, it's funny. When you get saved, God changes your desires. Have you noticed that? Th things that, that before you used to think were weird, now you enjoy them. Like, well, like, like, like going to church, that used to maybe not have been a desire, but when you know God, you enjoy coming to church and being around his people and being around his preaching. Well, before, it, it didn't have any interest at all to you to read God's word, but, but once you know God and, and you get to have that relationship with him, now you have that desire. Now you have the desire to serve him, and, and that's what God does. He changes us. He sanctifies us. And even though there will be a lifelong struggle with sin, God is doing a lifelong process of making us to be more like Jesus Christ. And then in chapters 9 through 11, he talks about God's sovereignty. He talks about how God's in complete control. He, he speaks of how Israel was a chosen nation, how, how, how they were meant to display God's glory to the entire world, but because of their hard and wicked hearts, they, they failed in that area. And yet God was not taken by surprise. His plan of salvation continues unfazed. He, he's still in complete control. And I tell you, I think about that, and that's a truth that brings comfort to our hearts. That no matter when our world seems out of control, we have a God who we know is still in control. And Paul, he goes to the book of Romans, and he, he talks about the mercy of God. He, he talks about how, how God dealt with our sin. He talks about how God became our Savior. He talks about how, how God is transforming us from the inside out to be what he created us to be through sanctification. He talks about how he is a sovereign God, and he is never taken by surprise. He is always in control, and because of the mercies of God, he's a God that can be trusted. Paul makes a passionate plea. He says, as your brother in Christ, as someone that cares about you, he says, I beg you, look at the character of God. We'll look at the actions of God and come to the conclusion that your God is a God who is worthy of being trusted with your life. He starts with a passionate plea, and then he goes to a powerful picture. He goes on in verse 1, he says, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God. He shows us, second of all, that, that there is this picture of how we should be a living sacrifice to God. The, the original readers, they would have understood this picture. They were familiar with sacrifices. In the Old Testament, before Christ became the ultimate sacrifice, they would sacrifice animals on the altar. And that's how they would worship and, and give to the Lord. And what he's saying here is, is you need to give a living sacrifice. Well, when these guys heard the word living, they would have said that. That's a bizarre statement. Because a sacrifice is always dead. And what he's saying here is this, the way that you worship God and the way that you give to God now is not by sacrificing an animal, but the way that you sacrifice now is you sacrifice your life. You surrender everything that you have and everything you, that you are and give your life as an open check to God. This, uh, this last week we were getting ready for missions conference and one of the places they had to go is to get our cardboard that all the booths are using back there. And uh, the place we went, they don't take credit cards or any of that sort of thing, you had to do a check, uh, which you teenagers, you don't even use checks anymore, but it's this little piece of paper you fill out and they, they take it, you know. <laughs> and uh, so I, I went to Mike, he's our treasurer, I said, I said, hey, could I get a check to, to drop off at the, the paper company? And he said, sure. He said, how much you need? And I, I said, I, they said it's going to be this amount, and I kind of gave him down to the cents how much it was going to be. And uh, he said, he said, how about I just do this? And he went back and, and, and he filled out a blank check. Andy, you ever had Mike give you a blank check? <laughs> you should try it. It's great. <laughs> yeah. And he gives me this blank check. And man, the power was coursing through my veins, you know. And I had that check and took it with me. And, and they gave me the amount. And whatever I needed to fill in, I could just fill it in in the blank. That's what he's saying here. He's saying every Christian needs to have the mindset that they come to God and say, God, my life is a blank check. You fill in the blanks. Well, whatever you want me to do, that's what I'm going to do. Where, wherever you want me to go to school, that's where I'm going to go to school. Whoever you want me to date or marry, that's what I'm going to do. What, whatever ministry you want me to be involved in, my life's a blank check. Lord, you just take it. And he says we need to come to the Lord as a living sacrifice. Third of all, we see a pursuit of purity. I'll, I'll go quickly here. A pursuit of purity. He goes on in, in verse 2. 
And he says, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. He challenged us to, to live a pure life. He says, do not be conformed to this world. The word conformed means fashioned or molded. Don't be molded into thinking like the rest of the world. Don't live with the same philosophy the rest of the world lives with. In John, 1 John, he, he tells us what the world's philosophy is. He says the world's philosophy is the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. You study those out, and you'll find out that, that what those are talking about is pleasure and possessions and prestige. Does that not describe the average American today? Well, what is the average person living for? They're living for possessions, and they're living for pleasure, and they're living for prestige. He says, don't be conformed to this world. He said, you think differently. He says, be ye transformed. The word transform means to be changed into something totally different. It's the same word that we use for metamorphosis. And let me remind you that this word, this command, is a passive command. In other words, we're not the one who changes ourselves. It is God who changes us. God has a desire to change you into what he wants you to be, which is the image of his son. And he says God is the one that, that does this, so, so how do we be a part of it? How, how do we allow God to change us? He tells us, be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind. How do we allow God to change us? It's through the renewing of our mind. I saw a, a, a while back, they put together a documentary. I didn't watch it, but I read about it. And this guy, they did a study, and they said, for the next 30 days, we're going to track you and study you, and the thing we're going to do that's unique is every meal, three meals a day, you're going to eat McDonald's for 30 days straight. And uh, some of you teens are going like, that was my February, you know, that's, <laughs> that's typical. And they said, we're going we're gonna to let you do this, and then, then we're going to track your, your body weight and your triglycerides and all these sort of things. And, and they never got to finish the study. You know why? You probably know why. He got to 20, the 20th day of the study, and they said his body started to shut down. They said they actually had to hospitalize this guy uh, because of all the junk he was taking in. And I tell you, the same thing is true of us spiritually. If we allow our minds to be filled with junk, it will destroy us in our spiritual lives. The way God transforms us is by the renewing of our mind. It's by allowing our minds to be saturated in the truth of his word. It's by guarding our minds from the influences that we allow to take in, from guarding our thoughts on what we will dwell on. It's how God changes us to what he wants us to be. He gives us the pursuit of purity. And then finally, let me give you the perfect plan. And I tell you, this is my favorite point of the, the passage. He says at the end of verse 2, and that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. God's plan for your life is better than your plan for your life. He tells us that God's plan for your life is good and acceptable and perfect. Oftentimes I'll, I'll talk to teenagers and, and in their minds they think if I choose to be unconditionally surrendered to God, then I'm going to miss out. If I choose just to sell out for the Lord, then, then I'm going to be miserable. Can I encourage you with this? If that's what you think will happen, you don't understand your God. Our God is the one who created you. He knows you better than you know yourself. And he says that he has a good and acceptable and perfect plan for your life. A couple years ago, three or four years ago, we went down to Hoosier Hills. Anybody been to Hoosier Hills, the, the Christian camp down at, in Versailles? And uh, it's called Hoosier Hills because the center of campus has this massive hill. Probably not as tall as Memorial Park, uh, but probably a little bit steeper. And one of the things they do throughout the week is they have one day where they turn that giant hill into a giant slip and slide from the top all the way down. It's awesome. And uh, we were there, we took the teenagers, and, and Emily was with us. She had just turned three years old. And I'm looking at this hill, and I said, I said, Kara, I said, I think, I think Emily would like that. I think she would enjoy it. Uh, I, I just know her personality. I think, I think she would have a good time. And she goes, well, she's just three years old. I said, I know, I know, but, but I, I think she'd have fun. I think she'd enjoy it. And uh, we went back and forth for a little bit, and eventually she gave me the uh, um, look. And if you... If you don't know what that means, that means you can do it, but if she gets hurt, I'm going to kill you. That's what that <laughs> look means. And so, so one was checked off the list. You know, she said, all right, fine, do it. And so I go up to Emily, and I'm thinking, how am I getting it? She's three. You know, that's a big hill. I said, 
said, how am I going to get her to do this? So I said, I said, Emily, do you like slides? She goes, yeah, I like slides. You, you want to go see a really big slide? Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I take her by the hand. We walk up the, the deck to where the start of the slip and slide is. We go to the top of the deck, and, and I just know if I can get her to go down it, she's going to love it. But she's looking at this, this hill, and, and you can see the, the, the wheels are turning a little bit. And she's thinking, man, this thing's bigger than I anticipated. And I said, I said, I said, Emily, hey, you're going to love it. Just sit right here, slide right down. You have a great time. And, and uh, try to go so fast you couldn't think about it, you know. And so she, she hops on the slide. They start out with a little tube. It's about 10 foot long. You go down this tube, and then you shoot down to the slip and slide and, and put her down there. And she, she goes down the tube, and, man, she picked up speed. Like, she shot out of that little tube like a little 35-pound torpedo just coming out of that. <laughs> and she's going down the slip and slide, and she's just skipping like a, like a rock across the lake. And uh, for the first time, I'm thinking, maybe this wasn't <laughs> the greatest idea, you know? And so, so I run down the hill, go around there, find her, and uh, I, I look at her. I said, Emily, are you okay? And she looked at me. She goes, can I do that again? <laughs> and I looked at Karis, and I said, I told you so. <laughs> I told you she would like that. I was thinking about that when I, I was studying this passage. Because I... I knew Emily, and I, I knew the thing I was asking to do was a little bit scary, a little bit intimidating, but I knew if she would do it, I really believed she was going to love it. And that's what God's saying here. He's saying, I'm asking you to completely, 100%, step out in faith and unconditionally surrender your life to me. And he says, I know that's a big ask. I know that's something that's intimidating, but if you do it, you're going to love it. My plan is a good and acceptable and perfect plan for your life. It doesn't mean life's always easy. It doesn't mean there's never any troubles. It means it's a good plan. It means God's plan is better than our plan. And so Paul, he, he talks, why should we give our life to God? Why should we unconditionally give every area, holding nothing back to God? We look and we see it's because we have a God who is merciful and we can trust his character. We see that it is reasonable that if God can die for us, then surely we can live for him. We see it's because we can pursue purity, and it's the way that God can transform us into who he has created us to be. And it's the way that we get to experience God's perfect plan for our life. And I brought this message this week for a specific reason, for a specific question I want to give you. We're gearing up next week for Missions Conference, and I, I want to give you one challenge as we head into that. Would we as a church commit to coming to God coming to that missions conference with a surrendered heart? Could, could each of us make the decision today that next week, God, if you speak to my heart, I'll do whatever you say. If you show me someone in my life that I need a witness to, Lord, I'll do it. If you show me some sin in my life that I've been holding on to through the preaching, then, then Lord, I'll give it up. If you show me areas I need to give, whether financially or of my time, I'll, I'll just do whatever you want to do. I tell you, can you imagine a church that would do that? Can you imagine the way that God could use a church that was just unconditionally, 100% surrendered to him? Would you bow your heads? Would you close your eyes? Before we pray, I'm just going to ask you one question. It's the same question I just asked. And don't feel pressured to answer it this way. It's between you and the Lord. But if you say, Pastor Brian, I will commit to the best of my ability and by the grace of God to come to next week with a surrendered heart. Whatever the Lord speaks to me about, I will, by God's grace, surrender to do that area. Whether it's witnessing, whether it's missions, whether it's giving, whether it's serving, whatever it is, I promise next week to come with a surrendered heart. If you could join me in that, would you just raise your hand? No one else looking around. But I will come to the services next week with a surrendered heart, looking for the Lord to speak to me, to me looking for the Lord to change me. Praise the Lord. God could do something with a church like that. Lord, I thank you for today. And I thank you for the chance next week to be around good, godly missionaries and, and preachers and, and hearing your word. And Lord, I, I pray that not only would it be a week where we make financial decisions about our missions, but Lord, I pray it would be a week that you would deal with us, that you would show us areas in our life that we need to change, things we need to surrender and give to you. I thank you for all you've done. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Would you stand with me, please? Turn to hymn number 476. 476, 476. To Jesus I surrender, all to Him I freely give. I will ever love and trust Him in His presence daily live. I surrender.
appreciate you being with us. Robert, would you mind coming up here and dismissing us in a word of prayer? Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this message, Lord, and allow us to be surrendered totally to you, Lord, and uh, when we're making a decision, no matter what, let us be uh, based on your word, let us uh, have a transformed mind, Lord, and renew our mind, Lord, and uh, Lord, uh, you are a great God, and we thank you so much for everything you have done for us. We thank you for um, you dying for our sins, Lord, and and uh, Lord, let's just be surrendered to you. In your name I pray. Amen.